Right, we're recording. Mick Cartwright. Mick Cartwright, who does not yet have a um, have a screen name yet. Mick Cartwright in the H Hour Studio of 183. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for travelling from sunny Colchester. Beautiful Colchester. Was it cold this morning? It was fucking cold yeah, this morning. It was morning. freezing when I got up, yeah. That's why I only wore a T-shirt. <laughs> Lucky the uh, heating's so good in this studio right now. Yeah. <laughs> Balmy. <laughs> Freezing this morning. <laughs> Freezing this morning. Um, would you consider a screen name? No. Why not? I think Michael Odin Cartwright is good enough. Did you Did you choose Odin yourself? Your middle no, name? no, I didn't. But if I was to choose a name, I would have chosen that one. So, <laughs> so who named your dad? Named my Jordan? dad was uh, Viking, I thought, yeah, Viking nut. So yeah, no he, way. he loved all of that. Yeah, I thought Odin was just something you put on Facebook as your middle name just for a laugh. No, no, it's not. Odin's actually. A I should have brought my passport. That is good. <laughs> it should just be Michael Odin. <laughs> Michael Odin. Okay. Yeah, that is that is my username on a lot go. of things. Is it? <laughs> there you go, Michael Odin. Mega. Yeah, mega. My granddad, his his, he's in the TV and film industry. And his birth name was Buggy. Buggy? Yeah, so I should have been Hugh Buggy. But he changed <laughs> it but before, obviously, he, before, um, I think before my dad was born, he changed his surname to Kia, which I'm grateful for, yeah. Hugh Buggy. I don't think my daughters would have appreciated being called uh, <laughs> the Buggies either. Yeah. When did you decide to get into into TV and film? How did, in fact, how did you find out about it? Um. Because you got out, you got out t over ten years ago, right? I got out in two thousand and eight. Okay, yeah. So when did you foray into TV and film? Well, I started doing. I did sort of CP work for what four or five years, and it's basically a continuation of the military. So you know, I was, it was fine, no issues. And then I joined Network Rail, and it was so boring. And I just started looking for other things to do. You know, just. I hated it. I still hate it now. I only work there weekends, but uh, I just wanted to do something out there. I always loved TV and film. It's always been a bit of a an escape. So, yeah, I was like, I was suffering with mental health issues. Like, I just didn't want to go out. Didn't want to do fuck all. You know, I just didn't want to be around people. And I just forced myself to go to. I started researching it, and I thought, right, ex-military, all that sort of stuff. And I found a company called Services to Film, and I, you know, I just signed up to them. And when they had a job come through, I actually turned the first one down because I thought, oh, you know, it's going to London, loads of people on the tube, and I fucking hate it. <laughs> and, and honestly, this is how I was, and this is this is how it's changed me quite a lot. So you know, I'm fluttering about everywhere now. I just lost that confidence around people, and you know, I just I started doing this first day on set was massive you know there was about a hundred people what was the production it was the great the great it's got uh nick holt and l fanning in it okay and i was in a scene with them first day and i was featured so i was pulling out uh, an actor from a fire and dragging him you know and it was it was crazy yeah dialogue with the director as well first day on set and that was just from then on i was hooked i loved it thought it was yeah. brilliant Shit money, great time. Yeah, I suppose it's shit depending on like how far you're traveling and stuff. Because uh, I know services of film and, and they they do uh, like saying you've got Dicky Tran come on soon. Yeah, and so they they I didn't know, but and and you know this well now. The like the FAA rates, there's like standard rates everyone pays across the board. I yeah. don't I don't think it's that shit. <laughs> I, it's all relative. I I mean, yeah, I remember when when I was doing the stuff. Last year, I bumped into you on, on set, and I mean, COVID was a bit of a gift yeah. for people, I think, it, yeah. for money-wise, because <clears throat> you'd go and, like, you'd have, you'd have to go and get a test before, the day before, the day before the production. Some productions, two or three days before, every day. Yeah, I was yeah doing that's that. right, yeah, I mean, get a test, and you get paid every time yeah. for, that, for just having a test, and it was like, decent. How much were you getting paid? Oh, I can't remember. Yeah, well, I'd when it first came out, I was going to like Pinewood Studios or something. This is when it first kicked off. I was getting 150 quid a day just for a COVID test. No. Um, yeah. And it, obviously it started to, to whittle down when, <laughs> when they realized that that's a bit much. 150 quid a day oh just for God. a, it, it was a, it was a two hour drive, two and a half hour drive. 
there and back. So four hours, ten minute turnaround when you get there. It was it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Have you uh, so um, so? Why have you always been interested in TV and film? Then what's because because you could argue that everyone's interested in TV and film, like. Everyone maybe thinks in the back of their head, oh, I wouldn't mind being an actor or an actress. Yeah. I, I don't think many people think about the behind, the behind the camera stuff, but certainly in front of the camera. What was different with your interest in it? How come you got into it? I, you know what? I just, I, I've always seek to do th- things that are sort of out of the ordinary, you know, because uh, the, the boring humdrum every day it just, honestly, just feels like the slow death. <laughs> it's fucking, it, it just, that's just how it, how it gets me. But, yeah. You know, it definitely helped me in so many ways. I was just, you know, I said how I was. I was like, I didn't want to big crowds, didn't like to be around people and Why stuff. Why is that? A- I don't know. I was just, I was just in a bit of a depressive bubble, you know. It was, it was shit for a little while, for a long time. I say a little while, it was for a long time. Good, good three, four years after leaving the military. Not when I was doing this sort of, you know the, the stuff abroad, the CP stuff, because that's just a that's just an extension of the military. So you're you're around blokes, you got that support base, even if you don't feel like you got it, you, it's there. You know, there's all that banter. You know, you could be with a bootneck and you just take the piss out of each other the whole time, but you know, it's it's still there. And then after that, it's just this slow decline. I just started going downhill massively, and uh, yeah, I, was, I had some really shitty moments, and then. I just started doing this. I, I started hoping a bit more, you know, thinking, you know, because you're so close to it. I think, and I've always been necky anyway. So, you know, you know, you're on set. You've got an actor here. You've got an actor there, and you think, well, they can do it. Why the fuck can't I do it? You know, <laughs> I can do that. And then I started doing acting classes, and I just thought, if I'll do it as a hobby, but if I can do some acting classes, so if one day I'm on set, I can be ready, you know to do something if they wanted me to say something then I, I'd have the confidence to get up and do it yeah. and so I started doing I did a few terms at um, the Unseen Acting School and I still go back now occasionally what's that the Unseen Acting School I've not heard of that it's um, it's in London it was above Soho House um, I think it's moved now like in the last couple of months but yes yeah, you pay for a term of six weeks and you go every Saturday it's all day so it's a good six hours I think so what are you doing? So you you do a lot of script reading. You start is, off. Is it designed for someone brand new to the industry? Is it? Uh, yeah, the first class is, and then after you've been going for a little while, they bump you up to an evening class, and then so I did one term at the beginners, and then I got bumped up to the second one. Um, and honestly, I've been shot at. I've been fucking. You know, I've done all sorts of crazy shit shit myself when I had to stand up and do a reading in front of people oh, in the mate, class. Talk me, talk me through it. Right, what was day one like when you first went? Uh, day one, you sort of go in um, and you'll do like a relaxation exercise. It's all about, it's like you do about 20 minutes of sort of meditation just to calm everyone. I, I imagine it's just to calm everyone down and it, it really helps. Minutes. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's good. Time. Yeah, it's good. You sort of lay on the floor and then you go through things. and But by the time you get up, you're not as nervous about working with other people and you know so they break you down into a pairs and, and then you do a bit of script reading sort of backwards and forwards you don't have to memorize anything because you it's hard to memorize in a day I'm, I'm shit with that anyway so but yeah you don't have to memorize anything you just read from the script and do it in as many different ways as you can and then you just fire it back and forward and then when you're ready you'll get up and do it in front of in front of half the class so he breaks it down to do half the class so it's not as daunting but my first day I thought fuck I don't want to do that (laughs) (laughs) and and he's noticed I know he's noticed because he's seen me not put my hand up and then I thought got right to the end and I thought fuck yeah he's he hasn't noticed me I'm good and then he's gone (laughs) right let's get the whole class in and he's picked me out and my partner and said right up on the stage so he's made us get up on the stage in front of her I'm glad he did though because I realise once you get up there and you just focus on the person in front of you, everybody else just kind of melts away. And it's it helped. What was the scene? I don't Can know. you remember? Um, yeah, it's a comedy show. On, oh, I think it's, it's something to do with parents at school. Oh, I was playing a woman as well, and I didn't realise <laughs> that you should just you should just like adjust it to yourself. But you know, I was putting in, like a high pitched voice on and that. <laughs> but, but yeah, 
it was good fun. By the second time, I was already quite confident, you know, to get up in front of people. It's still scary, you, you know, every time you get up. And I think that's the buzz of it. So you go away leaving like you've overcome something, like you've achieved something, you know, because it's so scary to stand up in front of people. It's one of, it's like the biggest fear in public speaking. It's like, you know, other than death <coughs> itself, it's the biggest fear. Is it really? Yeah, public speaking, getting up and... You know, I suppose people don't really think about it, but once they actually have to do it, and they think, fuck, you know, there's a lot of people there. And, you know, it's, it's like one of the top, you know, it's, it's like top five, I'm sure it is. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. Um, like, well, you and I know at least, well, I'm not going to name the person, <clears throat> but there is a guy who uh, who is super nervous about uh, uh, public speaking, to the point where I think it was one of the things that inhibited his career. Because as a as a commander, you need to be able to give things like briefs, get up, talk to people en masse. Yeah. And uh, I don't think he was comfortable doing it. <clears throat> I didn't know that until someone else told me since uh, since leaving. But um are they so acting, training, learning the discipline, are there different disciplines to to the things that make an actor. So when you did that, so when you did that, uh, you started on that the course, the course, the the the, the uh, what you call it, the term, term. Course? Yeah, it's just a term of six weeks. When you started on that term of six weeks, was it like did they give you a breakdown of right? These are the these are the six aspects that you need to work on to make to become a great actor. Number one is I don't know facial expression control. No, like for example, I don't no, know. They can do that line. sort of stuff. Go on, because no, it's on. more about being sort of natural you know trying to trying to bring out yourself in the part so I, I know different schools probably do it differently so you know a lot of it is getting up having the confidence to read the script in front of people and then doing it in your way so how do you do that if you played a woman though, Mike? yeah you wouldn't normally play every time i got a partner i always <laughs> made them play after that first time i always made them play the woman so no, i'm not doing that part <laughs> <I'm totally laughs> <off one. laughs> But you could, you, you just adapt it to yourself and, you know, have that person be the, the male. So, yeah, it's, I really enjoy it, you know. Just so when I go there, it's good. Afterwards, it's, you know, after being so scary, so stand, so it, you don't really get used to it as such. I take a couple of L-theanines before I go in, nice and calm. A couple of what? L-theanines. It's like the compound in tea. Right, okay. It's, and it's nice and calming. I've, yeah, L-theanine's good. I'm taking that for years now. <clears throat> so, what do you? So, is there anything you find particularly easy or difficult about it? Um, you teach me, mate. I'm I'm trying to learn. I'm a sponge absorbing your experience and knowledge of do you know what? The, of your the, of your the, acting. The biggest and thing is just to be to be or be your authentic self. So you, you so you get a script and you do it as if you were in a situation. Obviously, you know you're not a mass murderer or anything like that. But you have to. You know, if you were playing a mass murder, you'd have to put yourself in that situation and say, what would I do, you know? But, you know, it's, it's not easy. Act, you know, when you look at actors, you think, oh, fucking hell, I could do that. Was it's not easy to learn. It's not It's they not easy it, to do. <sighs> they look, make it look easy, don't, don't they? Yeah. They make it look easy. I remember, so on, the, on Slow Horses, when we were on that, you know, I had some time around... People like Guy Oldman, Chris and Scott Thomas. Yeah, I did. Yeah, um, and uh, and you just see them, and you think you don't see them rehearsing their lines. You don't see them. Doing that. You just they just you know the the, the the it's not rolling. Action gets shouted, and they're just reading off their lines perfectly. Yeah, just as if it's nothing. But then they've been in it for so long. I bet they develop a thick, like photographic memories and and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, it's uh, well. I've heard that some of them really have trouble with their lines. It's you know, you hear about stories of actors that have got earpieces in. I got someone reading it to them as they as they go in. Really? Yeah, I've, I can't remember who it was, but I have read that definitely. <clears throat> it's um, but yeah, I did a scene with those as well. I was playing was it Kirsten Stock, Scott Thomas's bodyguard, but they cut the scene. <laughs> I, thought, Fuck. I was doing that all day as well. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you do you find it? So you find it quite natural then doing it. Only because now that, 
you know, now that I've got my own confidence back, I don't mind. You know, I'll get on set. I've been spoilt, really, and so, and so have you, because you've you've had you've got you've come straight into it and started speaking to the director. They ask you what you're doing. You see, normal extras don't usually get that. That's quite rare. Yeah, so. I heard this. So obviously, that was my first production where I bumped into you on on that scene. Same deal. I was on that for about eighteen months in total. And uh, I remember there was a couple of other people said that. Said this is such a different. This is such a different experience. Yeah. Other extras who who doing extra stuff all the time. They said this is such a different experience to what it normally is. Even from the way the director was, it's a different director in the second and the third series. But on the first and second series, the same director. Even the way the director was with the extras, uh, like tapping into people's knowledge. As an example, ex yeah. military with military scenes. I got asked a couple of times on stuff, and. Uh, and yeah, they said that it's so different. It was just a, it was a generally pleasant production to work on. Yeah. But then I went on, I went on, did another, another day, and that was later on. I think I was series three and it was a different director, and I did not enjoy that day. No. I did not enjoy that day at all. Didn't it was, feel valued at all. In hey, it, no, it, you know, it wasn't about, about valued. It <laughs> seemed <clears throat> it was. Whereas on the first two series. I think it was I think it was the first and second that the first director was there. It seemed like it was just more efficient. Now I don't I don't think that the TV and film industry is that efficient at all, right? But that seemed more efficient. There was less. There was more. There was in fact, you know, talk about value. They definitely they definitely tried to uh, be more accommodating of the people who weren't actors, the the people on the periphery, on screen and off screen, so you know the runners and the extras, like providing tea and coffee, for example, like providing somewhere under uh, out of the rain to go and shelter yeah. while you're waiting for a shot to be taken. And uh, and later on that didn't happen. That may just be the way it is. But and again that's like I mean that's the same as in the military, right? A commander changes and everything can some things change for the good, some change, things change for the bad. Yeah. But yeah, in general, I enjoyed it. It was fascinating. Re- and, and, and luckily, really luckily, I got to be around some... Guy Oldman is, uh, is, is my pro- probably my number, number one favourite actor of all, of all time. Yes, and all me as time. well. I didn't even know he was on Slow Horses until we started filming. And then they end, at one point, I was in the green room with him. I got put in the green room by a new runner by accident not thinking I was an actor because I got to the set early because I was driving, I was driving Chris and Scott Thomas in the scene. Yeah. I had to get there early and, um, and familiarize myself with the car. It's big, brand new Jag. And then I was stood there waiting around and they put me in the green room and then, Guy Oldman walked in. Did you make yourself at home? I fucking did make myself at home. <laughs> I would have as well, I did yeah. <laughs> Guy Oldman walked in. Chris and Scott Thomas walked in. <clears throat> oh, Chris, Chris, Chris Wiles? Chris Wiles? Not Chris Wiles. Oh, what's his bloody name? Who was playing Duffy? Guy was playing Duffy Walker. Oh, okay, in. yeah. Uh, and I was thinking, oh my God. Just to be in the same room. I was you know, super lucky. And then uh, and there's a couple of other scenes that was quite close to Guy Oldman in the scene. And um, it's just, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it, it is a really interesting industry to be in, to be a part of, regardless of what you're doing. But it does have its down, like there's a lot of waiting around, standing around. Oh yeah. my God. Oh my God. That fucking broke me. Broke me. But the difference is I <clears throat> I, wasn't, I was doing that as a bit of a jolly because I thought it was only going to be one or two scenes over across one or two days, not across 18 months. But I suppose it's different from your position, other people's position. If I was, if I was thinking I want to go into this as a career, I'd be sitting there trying to soak up everything, and I'm not the most social of people. So, and I definitely wasn't very social on on set. So, like, leave me the fuck alone. I just kind of like that because yeah. there's no reason for me to need to go and network with anyone on them, on there because I haven't got an aspiration to do it. Um, but the insight is invaluable doing that stuff. Yeah, you know, and uh, and um, where the fuck was I going with that then? I think you touched on something there, definitely, because... I have a question for you. Go on. Because if, you know, like you said, because you're you're not using it as a sort of networking. and you, So for me, I do want to go further with it. But if I don't, it's not the end of the world, you know, so I'm ready for it. But, you know, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. I'm not, I'm not pushing full steam ahead, you know. I, I, because I like it as a hobby as well and I enjoy it, I don't want to take that enjoyment out of it. So, 
you know, speaking to people on set actually helps me. It helps me to be more sociable and stuff like that. So I see it as networking, but, you know, it's helping me in my everyday life as well. So you know, I've met loads of friends now doing this. It's so many people, especially doing, you know, like the STF stuff, because that's all ex-soldiers. Well, mostly ex-soldiers. And we all sort of, you know, we all know each other now. We've all got each other's numbers and stuff. And, you know, you know that's good. It's good to have that network. Mm. I tell you one thing it did uh, show me is how much <clears throat> how much effort and planning and logistics there is that goes into now COVID aside like pandemic planning aside but it goes into putting a film a, 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 just a scene production together mm. anywhere let alone London the planning and effort that goes into that oh my god yeah. oh my god and then you factor in COVID and the COVID restrictions and all that because when I was surprised when I was surprised when that job came up, I thought, "Fucking hell, they're doing this, they're doing this through the pandemic." Like, how? How? I was thinking, how is the TV and film industry? How are they allowed to keep working like this? Because yeah, you know, how are they allowed to keep working like this through the pretty, pandemic? Pretty heavy restrictions, down. though, weren't they? On well, this is the point I'm coming to. Mm. <clears throat> Holy, oh my god, the restrictions are crazy. Like we were talking about, mm. coming from talking about on the podcast on the icebreaker. But you know, if I was on. If I was going to be on set on the Saturday and they wanted me to have a haircut as well, let's say they wanted me to have a haircut and a costume fit on the Friday, I'd have to go and get a test on the Thursday or the Wednesday. So travel to a studio, get a COVID test, wait for that to come back positive, uh, negative. <laughs> then I go and get the haircut the next day. Then after I've had the haircut, I have another test because I need another test to test negative so I can go on set the following day. Yeah. And then you go on set the following day. Get and if you're on test. set the following day after that, you te you're testing every day. Yeah. And then what surprise was when I got on set, you know, you think, I, I literally had it in my head, I thought, they're not going to be, they, they, you tell me about all the restrictions, like masks everywhere. You literally get, you have to keep your mask on until the last safe moment where they're just about to, they're just about to roll the cameras. And then you, and you take the mask off. And I had it in my head, especially on the first day, I, went, I thought, people are going to be, they're going to be cutting corners here. There won't be any masks on set. You're going to get on set. People will be taking the piss. You'll be like, right, as soon as you get into a building, because some of the, you know, a lot of the scenes are indoors. As soon as you get inside and you can't see, like, Joe Public, because we would do a lot of scenes in London, <clears throat> you know, and you'd have Joe Public, like, in the house next door, looking out the window, seeing what's being filmed in the street. Yeah. But even when you got indoors out of prying eyes, all the masks would still be on. The COVID restrictions are being applied like rigidly yeah. by everyone on set. Like I really admired it. I really admired it. And it reminded me of, which made me laugh, reminded me of, remember when Tom Cruise had that outburst? Yes. Right at the of the pandemic, went mental at someone. It was about following, it was something to do with the COVID restrictions, wasn't it? Yeah, set. you know why? Because... Well, I understand now. Yeah, 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 yeah because on. they lose so much money yeah, and exactly. they'll shut the production down. Yeah, exactly. If they catch them, that's it. Yeah, exactly. It'll be shut and that's down. Why and they'll so lose rigid. millions. Yeah, yeah, and that's why it's so rigid. And I had admiration for that. No cutting corners, you know. Um, and, and which is hard when there's so many people, mate. How... I have to think, there is some driftwood. On this production. There are some people there. Like... I like to think if you went now, we went, <clears throat> if you had, had no prior knowledge, you with Mick Hart, right, had no prior knowledge of how a scene is put, to, is, is filmed, right, never mind about the actors doing what the actors do, but Mick, we want to film a scene in central London. Uh, you have got as many people as you want, or as few people as you want, put a team together to make that happen. You know, we're talking from the cameraman to the runner, you, you put that team together. I reckon you would come up with about. 50% of the number, your total, your total workforce would be about half the size they are now. Yeah. There's too many people. <laughs> yeah. Because you've got <laughs> runners, second yeah, runners, third runners. People and, yeah. everywhere. There's people who literally the job is to go and pick up coffee. And again, this is, this probably also varies. You know more than me. I've only done one produ production. You've done a bunch. Does that vary production to production? Yeah. Is um, there more or less some are, production? Yeah, some production? are massive. I did, um, I did that new Ridley Scott film. Um, Which one's that? It is Napoleon. Okay. I'm not sure if that's the title or not, but it's about Napoleon. So, and that was I didn't I didn't enjoy it because there was so many people on set and you didn't get looked after really. But it's you know I, that's understandable because there were hundreds of people on set and they just couldn't you know just couldn't keep up. It was fucking crazy. But yeah, there's <clears throat> it was there was runners everywhere. They're all trying to accommodate you, but they just couldn't because there's too many people. And then you've still got the COVID restrictions. You've still got to put 
the, I'm going to be looking in the next few films, you know, over the next couple of years, there's going to be some COVID masks on the floor somewhere. <laughs> you know, you can... The, the amount of people that still had bits of string... Oh, you mean on up, screen? <laughs> on <the> screen, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The amount of people that had, like, COVID masks hanging out their pockets and stuff like that, and you just think, fucking hell, get a grip. <laughs> you know yeah. I mean? Yeah. We did a scene in uh, Stansted, and it was there was something like... 200, 300 extras. Yeah. Was that the first episode? Yeah, oh, that was the first episode. Yeah. Oh, I saw you on that. Yeah, it was the first away, episode, yeah. yeah. Uh, 200, 300 extras. It was mental, mate. Yeah. It was mental. Took over a, a terminal, an unused terminal at Stansted. That was crazy. That was services to film. I think they organise all of those. They do a lot of them, yeah. I think they organise all the extras for that, yeah. I did, um, I did Star Wars. That was brilliant. Honestly, the Star Wars set was Go on. fucking amazing. Where was it? It was, it's in a quarry just outside of London. I can't remember the exact place, but... Which, which Star Wars film is this? This is uh, the TV series uh, Andor. That's just come out now. Okay. And that was... I was on it about five weeks. Some of them were on it six or seven weeks. And they, you know, they take a photo of you as well with like 200 cameras in a dome so they can digitalise you and stuff like that. So oh, really? They, yeah, so they wanted to blow you up and they can use your image and stuff. No way. Yeah. And uh, that was, if you were a Star Wars fan, you would pay to walk around that set. It's that nice. It's amazing. What do you mean nice? You it, mean? It's just, it's massive and they've spent millions on it and you could walk in any door on set and it will take you to something in the Star Wars universe. <laughs> it's, 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 and I'm nosy, so I wandered off on set and had a look. Uh, yeah, and it was crazy. So what? <clears throat> what were the uh, so do they, do they use the same location for filming all the time then? No, but that that stuff was just for the that's on the planet of Andor or whatever. No, Andor's planet. Andor's the the, the guy, but um, I'm not sure what the the world's called. But everything on that world was done in that that studio, and it was it was crazy. When I walked in one room, and you can see the two speeders, it looked like the two speeders from. Um, uh, Phantom Menace really off that yeah so we were just walking about having a look and it's amazing this set was amazing I was supposed to be a, a stormtrooper but I went along to the fitting and I'd not updated my fittings you know all the all the numbers and stuff and he said no we can, I tried getting it on and he's saying no 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 it's not fitting mate I said no 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 I'll suck in <laughs> I don't want to fucking do this <laughs> he's like no it's not happening mate and this is the only one we got left I said look I really want to do this. And he's like, I'll tell you what, we'll put you down as a mud trooper, which is like, they're like the pre storm troopers. So the mud what trooper, they well, they've got the helmets on and they're like shock troops. So it was even better because you get to see my face as well. <laughs> so I'm not covered by a, a full, vi full visored helmet. <clears throat> but yeah. I was are you, have you, are you in any of the episodes yet? Um, I'm told I'm in the last couple of episodes. You've not I, watched it? No, 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 because they're not all out yet. Uh, no, somebody, I, all, yeah. you know, somebody I know who was on a production have seen them all, and they've said that, yeah, you know, I should be in the last because I got a feature, and I got cut away early because they can't keep using it if, if you get featured. So, it's me, and another guy, and the camera comes in. Uh, so the actors stood behind us, and we're just there. He said, basically, we had to look mean, and I had the fucking sun in my eyes, but it was cold <laughs> as well. And I just felt like I was back in Northern Ireland. <laughs> you know, it was fucking shit. I was thinking it was a long day. I said, this is not going to be hard to look mean now. So I just played myself. And uh, the camera comes in, looks at me, goes up over our heads to the main actor at the time. And we should get a bit of screen time, but, you know, they might cut it. <laughs> like they do. So they get paid for it, though. Still got paid for it. Yeah, it was not too bad, that. It was clearing sort of 300 quid a day on that one. Yeah, that's what, uh, uh, that's what surprised me on the... Uh, one of the things I learned about it is all the different... The extra little the payments bumps. you get. Yeah. Little payments you get for doing different things. So, like, holding a weapon, you get paid extra. Firing a weapon, you get yeah, paid firing extra. firing a blank, yeah. Firing a blank, you get paid extra. Um, so, uh, yeah, a facial expression that you're asked to make. Yeah. Like a gesture, you get paid extra. Creative for that. reaction. Crea yeah, creative reaction. You get, you get paid extra for that. Saying something, you get paid extra for that. What else is there? There's loads of shit. Oh, yeah, working through your lunch. 
Yep. <laughs> Missing a meal, you get paid extra for that. It's yep. quality. It's like all the stuff in the military, if you got paid for all that. I'd be a millionaire if you got paid for all that stuff in the military. <laughs> millionaire. 24 yeah. hours a day getting paid, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a cool, it's a really, it is a really interesting thing to be a part of. It's like <clears throat> one of the reasons I'm glad I got, like, got you in today to talk to and then got Dickie Trant in soon as well. Uh, is um, is sort of to expose people to the industry as an yeah. as an option for go and do something a little bit different for a weekend or a day or a week. Or to look at it seriously as, as a, like a career, you know, after the military, absolutely, because it's uh, it is fascinating, and it's and every and in the same way, I suppose every production is completely different to the yeah. last production, you know, every ask is, and and eat positively or negatively, and the networks and the networking is amazing, the learning is amazing, just watching people like idols, fucking Gary fucking Oldman, man, watching him work, yeah, you know, it's just. Uh, <clears throat> it's just amazing and I think if you approach it with a good sort of attitude you'd really enjoy it so y you know you can be sat around but if you use that time sitting around to just chat to people about other productions and stuff like that you have a great laugh it's good it's like being back on the ranges you know when everyone's bored and pissing around you know it's yeah. just yeah it's good fun and you can come out of it so I, th I seriously think that you know if you're struggling like social anxieties anything like that and you go along to these things and put yourself out there because it is, you know, it can be scary if the director, you know, you're in there on your first day and he gets up and he says, right, I want you to fucking pick this guy up and carry him over there. And you're like, fucking hell, here we go. <laughs> it was good fun though. Mm. Yeah. How long have you been doing it for now? When was your first production? Oh, two years now. And that was, what was it? The Great. That was The Great, yeah, that was The Great. Did the yeah. great? I can't remember. I did the crown after that. Oh yeah. I've been on the crown a couple of seasons actually. That's Gillian Anderson's in that, isn't she? Um, she she plays Margaret Thatcher, doesn't she? She does. I didn't do that one. Um, yeah, I think she played Maggie Thatcher. Yeah. I played a sailor on there. What on crown? On, on the, the crown, crown, yeah. And I also played. So I, <laughs> so I had to wear the big bearskin hats and march around the square. I'd have thought. Oh, are you a guardsman? Yeah, I was a guardsman. Oh my God. I was thinking if, I, if all the Paravedge lads could see me now. <laughs> I was thinking I don't want a feature. What? I don't want to be seen. <laughs> what was the scene? It was just marching up and down the square for like the Queen's birthday or something like that. It was, I think it was set in like 81 or something like that. So it was hell. That was probably the only one I didn't enjoy because it was just like the worst part of the military for me or for Power Edge blokes was just marching, you know, drill. Yeah. Uh, name me a bloke in Power Edge that likes doing drill. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 That's that. Yeah. That was. There was. That was. That, I, there was bits um, with the with weapons and that on the, on some of the old ho uh, slow horses scenes where. They ask you to do stuff that go completely against. Yeah. Like in your head, I would not. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put myself there like that. Yeah, you got to I'm grapple with that. I'm completely yeah. exposed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the camera needs to see you. Yeah. Like, are you <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, all right. Can you just? Uh, can you just, in this scene? Can you just? Can you guys in the back of the vehicle? Can you just cock your weapons? No, no, no. We wouldn't. We wouldn't. We wouldn't nope. be doing that here. They'd already be done. Yeah, but that would be done oh, miles away where God. they can't hear you. Because <laughs> yeah. in my head, I was thinking someone's going to see one of the blokes. Let's say thing. One of the blokes going to see this and go, "Why the fuck is he doing that? Why is he doing those drills? What am I?" <laughs> but it's not me. <laughs> you know, it's not me. I'm not doing this. I know. <laughs> I know. It's funny. It's funny. Yeah. So I just did a. It was a documentary about two guys in Florida. They were, so they like um. I think they were like a Mexican drug cartel or something like that, like recently, like in the last few years. And I played I played the FBI guy that was catching them, but I also played one of the guys that got caught. Oh, right. <laughs> because it's slightly blurred. It's like oh, um, right. the focus, it's not blurred, but the focus is on something else in the foreground, like a bag of money, and you're doing the stuff in the background. And they had me, I wasn't the commander, uh, and they had me with a weapon, and I'm sort of in the rear, basically. And I, as I've gone in, I'm covering my rear, doing a spin around and that, making sure there's nothing behind me. And the bloke's gone, what are you doing? I said, well, 
covering my rear you know what I mean you wouldn't just walk straight in without you know being exposed at the back he said no no don't don't worry about all that and I was thinking oh for fuck's sake here we go and uh, later on in the scene uh, I was sat in the um, in the car and I've got a driver and we're just about to go and take these guys down and I've got he's given me a weapon he's like you know how to use that I said yeah mate I'm ex-military because he didn't know and he went oh <laughs> said, he said I just want you to play around with it so you know I've I've cocked it, you know, done everything, cleared the weapon, put the thing back on, and he's looked at me and thought, okay, I'll just leave you to it then, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So is, uh, is the tempo of work picking up now? Are you, are, you, are you finding that you're doing more, you're getting more work? Does it work like that? Yeah, I took about, I think it's the, the way the pop sort of platform works. If you, you know, you're getting good reviews of people, you, I'm not sure. What if platform? It's, what platform? Pop is, um, oh, pop, pop. Yeah. Yeah, 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 so it's what STF and all that yeah. sort of are all on. If you, you know, you don't turn up late and stuff like that, and you sort of, and you're getting used a lot, you get sort of bumped to the top of the list. And I get offered work all the time, but at the moment I'm really busy with other stuff, so I'm sort of being a bit more selective. Uh, obviously, if something comes up like Star Wars or something I really want to do, then I'll just jump on it and sort of cut everything else, but. Yeah, when this documentary was just a day up in Norfolk, so I just decided to just jump on it and have a little have a little go. But I'm glad I did because it was all right. But I was just a bit clueless about sort of weapons drills and mm. stuff. But. Mm. What's your what what are you spend your time on? You was uh, you mentioned earlier you spend a, you spend a lot of time in the man shed at the end of the day. Uh, my man cave, yeah. The man cave, writing. Yeah. What are you writing? So I write short stories. Um, I'm sort of I've been working on another book as well. Another book? What do you mean another book? Well, so well, but, uh, hang on a minute. Well, where's the first one? So I've got a series of short <laughs> stories. So there is a short story. Uh, it's on Amazon at the moment. It's called um, Christ. What is it called now? Oh, I'll tell you later. It's just, gone, just, just to clarify, yeah. your first book, and you can't remember the name. It's a short story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you on there as Mike Lord and Cartwright? Mm-hmm. I'm gonna have a look now. Go on, yeah. continue anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've, I've been writing about stuff, you know, like Foreign Legion, Paras and all, just like a little memoir, basically. It's memoirs of Death. Memoirs of Death. It's my first course. short okay, story, but I'm going to write a series of them, so. Yeah, got five stars from about three people, so. Doing all right so far. That's good. <laughs> but, um, Screenplays, anything like that? I looked into that. I, mean, I can tell a story, but. I don't know if I've got time to learn another skill. You know? mm. <laughs> I'm just um, I'm stretched thin. I started I started a company called Grapple Beast. Dot, um, and we basically were doing NFTs with a utility behind it. You said you were you did a bit of NFTs. I've put there, H hour yeah. NFTs out there now. Have you? Yeah. You, so did like the cover of this podcast. So it'll be a yeah. I'll do an image, a cover, podcast cover image. You know, say episode 183. Mick, Mick Cartwright, Mick Odin Cartwright, get Odin, yep. there. Mick Odin Cartwright, blah blah blah, and then I'll I'll uh, cartoonize that and make it an NFT, but <clears throat> literally just because why not? Yeah, um, but I might y- I might use see I might use the NFT facility if you want to call it that in the future as a so people who own HR NFTs they may get access to something in the future. That that's the way that's, forward. <clears throat> yeah. The, the gold rush is over, right? So all that, you know, everyone flying in, making shitloads of money off of, you know, cat NFTs, you know, with that dodgy pixelated crap. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And, um, yeah, that's over now. You, you get the odd one or two slide through. But an NFT with a utility behind it, you know, that's the way forward. And people think, a lot of people don't understand NFTs and, I mean, what you don't understand. Well, the gold rush has been bad for people to understand it. Yes. So people, so people look at, and I'm generalizing, people look at NFTs and think, oh, um, people are charging me to own some form of what they call is art. And, and it really is what it is. And that is not incorrect. It's not incorrect. But it's more, yeah. But it has like tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Tip of the iceberg. Um, like you said, utility. So, gra- <clears throat> so grapple beasts, right? So I'm assuming you grapple, you do BJJ of some sort. You got an interest in it? I do. Yeah, I started Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu last year, and I just, okay. thought, and I, you know, I've been doing it 
Sometimes I'm doing it five times a week. Sometimes Where are you twice. Uh, BKK fighters in yep. Colchester. I love it. I do love it. I'm struggling at the moment with certain aspects, but you know, you know, I, just, I enjoy it's addictive, it. Addictive, isn't it? It is addictive. Yeah. Do you do it? Yeah. You I did. I've got time now. Uh, I say I've got the time. I did it for I did it for a couple of years on and off, but w- when I was doing it, I was with a, with small groups, so it was like the instructor ratio, instructor student ratio is really good. <clears throat> Learned quite a lot in a short space of time, and I had loads of time to train. I was working away as well in the Middle East, so I had loads of time to train, yeah. and then came back. And now I want to get back into it over the last few years. But the long and short of it is where I live. The class times of the of the schools that are there. They don't match up with when I'm available to train. So I started boxing instead because the, the class that they just got, like, for example, early morning is the best. I need early yeah. morning. So I'll go boxing like six in the morning <laughs> at a local boxing gym. Um, and it works. But, but funny enough, that, um, at the, is it Gracie Baja in Chelmsford? Yeah, there is one there. What's his name? Uh, there's a veg bloke, isn't there? <laughs> there. What's his name? Oh, for God's sake, mate. For God's sake. I'm going to have to look it up. Reg bloke, instructor there, and his name is... I bumped into it the other day. My memory is shocking. Shocking. D-A... D-A... Sorry, people listening or watching. Oh, I'll have to come back to it. Um, anyway, there's a reg bloke instructor at the, at the place in Chelmsford. The BKK never went there. I went to 7th um, seventh, seventh Legion or ninth Legion a couple of times. Oh, okay. Up on I think that's shut now. Is it? Yeah, I think so. Uh, right, I went there a couple of times when I when I was trying to get back into it when I was in Colchester, but um, I hijacked your story there. Yeah, so go on. Uh, you started last year at BKK. Yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, Had you done an MMA kind of stuff before that? Yeah, years ago. I did boxing, MMA, you know, kickboxing and all that. Um, but because I was working away on the ships... I always wanted to get a fight in, but, you know, because I was working away on the ship, so I'd do two months on, a month off, so I'd only get a month's training in before I'd have to piss off again on the ship, so, yeah. Now that I'm home, and I get to go most of the time if I'm not working and stuff like that, so I, I get a minimum twice a week, but sometimes I go four or five times, but listen, you can't complete it. That's what keeps me interested. There's so many different skills you have to learn. Um it's just infinite you know you can just get to the end or you think you get to the end like black belt maybe and the the black belts will tell you you know they know shit compared to so and so you know and you know it's just an ongoing and I like that because I won't quit now so you know because you can't complete it I can't get to a certain level and go "Ah, fuck it I've, I've done it now move on to something else which is what I do a lot with other things well I have done in the past but yeah, it's good. You can't complete it, so you can just keep going. Mm. Let's see, uh, is, did I see Gordon Ryan is about to retire? Is he? He's just won the... Oh, have I made that up? No, no, he's just won, well, I made he's just won the World Championship. He just won the World isn't Championship, yeah. hasn't he? Yeah, I thought he was talking about doing it next year as well. So no, I, 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 I may be talking rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> I may be talking rubbish. Anyways, let's come back to Grapple, Grapple Beasts. Grapplebeasts.com is... Uh, I, I basically... It's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu themed NFTs. So they're like, you know, the pictures rhino and geese and the rarity goes up as the belt ranks go up and the utility behind it. So basically I, I, I founded it on the ethos of, you know, sort of mutual respect. You know, everything you'd get in a jiu-jitsu academy, you know, in, and the utility behind it is, we call it the edu educate to elevate initiative so basically everyone who buys a grapple beast will have a utility um so once they've sold like 25 50 percent i can't remember what it is now you'll get a free course online which will basically be it'll either be you know coding a creative writing course we're, we're going to put it out to a vote to the community anyway and see you know what courses are most in demand but we're going to be doing that any anyway regardless of making money so the courses will be going up. The Grapple Beast. So Grapple Beast NFT owners will yeah. have access to free education, basically. Yeah. That they would other, otherwise have to pay for. Yeah. If it was. Well, we're creating right. the courses, but so the educate, you know, to elevate initiative is basically we want to get it out there to everybody as well. So like, 
you know, people who, you know, because some of these courses are like 15, 1,500 quid upwards. Well, we're going to price them a lot less How are you going to do that? What you, so what, give me ex, uh, an example of the, of the scope of the courses that you're going to cover. So the courses, so I've got coders and people like that that are going to do the courses. I've already been, you know, in, in contact with them. Um, it's just the... It's just the content of the courses that we're gonna we're gonna vote on. So I think a lot of coding, you know, there's a lot of coding stuff out there that I'd like to build that sort of platform that people can, you know, like a little coding gym sort of thing, a little coding academy where they can practice it. Because the best way to learn coding is to do it. I mean, you could learn all the theory until the cows come home, but you have to you have to get on, you have to get in front of the computer and you have to do it. Um, so that'll be part of the vote, I think. We'll be, and creative writing because I'm interested in that and I'll put that to the vote as well and just maybe some sort of computer security course something like that but that will all be dependent so once we've sold like 25% you know they become free to everybody who holds them but also they'll be cheap to everybody else anyway and these courses some 1500 quid they go up to about three and a half grand but we're looking there is no need for that that is just greed you know there's no need for that i mean a digital course doesn't cost that much to create i mean once it's created that's it you know you can just throw it out there so and then move on to the next one but you know i, I think a lot of these companies are really greedy and they're just they're cutting off that type of education structure to people i'm not a big this is, might be a bit controversial i'm not a big proponent of um sort of university and stuff only because I just think people waste their time there and they get out and they haven't got a qualification to actually do a job you know it's just not, I, know, I, I, I don't hate university but I just think that you know they end up coming out with a lot of debt you know they probably get a lot of, so I didn't go to university I work in network rail you know I don't need any skills for that and uh, I get paid quite a lot of money for it but it's, it's not that controversial <laughs> now. I think it would have been controversial 10 years ago. I think the tide is definitely turning on people's opinion on uni. Now, the only, see, you can't argue against... I don't think you can argue against the value of university when it comes to the, the professions like a lawyer, like yep. a doctor. And like Professor, a, Like teacher, a real doctor. Stuff, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, but in, in certain disciplines, like mm. the sciences and, and, and uh, law things like that but then there's a whole host of other stuff where you think man like to your point man yeah. you don't need to be going to uni to get that information in that way and to get that qualification which you could for an industry which you could get into without that yeah that debt creating thing you're going to do for three or four years yeah. I agree with you yeah I agree with you it's uh, it just like an industry led course you know you just you know once you get to the end you have these skills to do that job and that's that's just what we want to do. So on the courses, computer computer security, <laughs> possibly, you've got uh, coding. There'll definitely be a coding. Yeah, element, and definitely. then the creative writing. So that, that writing. is the anomaly in there. The other two are computer oriented or tech oriented, well, and they creative writing. I'm they, just giving people a choice. You okay, know, it's just yeah. you know this will be put to a vote. So I've created a I've created a grapple beans so grapple beasts. and I've also created the cryptocurrency coin in order to. It's called grapple coin. But that won't be dropped till a lot later on. That that will be so they can vote, basically. So it'll be part of the smart contract in the coin. So you need to explain this. To, so when you're talking about here, I know what you're talking about, right? When you're <laughs> talking about voting. I'll put it out to the vote. I'll put it out to the community, and they've created a coin, a token, and blah 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 yeah, blah. Yeah. There are people who ain't got a fucking clue on about. Yeah. They so, ain't got a fucking clue. So have you, so so have you got a, a, a how? Where's the community hosted? Are you, are you got this Discord server or something like that? I've got Discord. We've just set that up. I've got Facebook, which is where we've just finished doing a bit of marketing. So there's about, I think there's about 5,000 followers on oh, there. That's pretty good. Moment. Yeah. The Facebook, Facebook page was first. I thought I'd get that one out of the way first. And, and then we've got, I'm just starting my marketing now for Twitter and Discord. I've just set up the Discord server. That was, it took me a lot longer than I thought it would because... I did it, and then I looked at it, and I thought, that just looked bland and plain. So I got some advice, got some outside counsel, and uh, now it looks good. Now it looks like a professional server, which is what it is. Uh, and I've had people approach me for 
to become moderators and stuff like that already. So oh, cool. We're just sort of so you, on let price. me let me try and <coughs> understand this. <clears throat> so you are so the aspiration is down the line is to have this community. I'm I'm not telling you. I'm I'm asking. Yeah, you, yeah. right. Uh, is to, obviously I'm not fucking telling you. <laughs> <laughs> um, is to have a community of people like-minded individuals who are interested in the same thing. The common interest here is going to be grappling MMA, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu kind of stuff. Also, they have a techno- they obviously have a technology interest because they are they one they've they've got the ability to purchase NFTs, which means they've got some understanding of blockchain technology, yep. cryptocurrency, right? They've been able to set up a fucking wallet for Well, example. no, they don't need that because oh, okay. if you go on my website, it teaches you how okay. to do all that as well. Yeah, so and then so these people, the initial people who are the Grapple Beast NFT owners, part of that community, you want to empower them to be able to have a say on the direction Grapple Beast takes. For yeah, example, yeah, exactly. what courses that Grapple Beast could provide them yeah. uh, for free or for cheap and other things, right? Am I, did I explain that correctly? Yeah, pretty much, except okay. for you don't have to be interested in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to you know to to get into it but that's just the theme it's the theme of it and i like the ethos of it so and that's just how we did it um but yeah they will they they will vote on every as- aspect so so once we get to like 50 to 75% we want to donate to a few charities they'll get to vote on which charities to donate to uh once we get to 75% you know we want them to to actually sort of guide us on where the next roadmap's going to go. So there's a roadmap out there. It's all out now. It's all ready to go. The smart contract has been written. I just need to fill the, the list and then make it live. So, yeah, you can go on the website now and look at all this. So, you know, the roadmap's there. Um, it's a multi-stage drop as well. So, you know, the price will go up in increments. The first 100 are free. Uh, and then once what, we the first 100 there, NFTs are free? Yeah, but they'll have to do certain things, you know, like share the page and stuff like that. So we're, we're looking at a little competition at the moment. So I'm just I'm speaking with a guy on on Discord at the moment. He's a bit of a marketing manager because I've had to teach myself so much stuff for this. You know, I'm working with a couple of other people. They they want to remain, you know, remain anonymous. But you know, this is my baby at the end of the day anyway. So I'm, I'm quite happy for them to remain anonymous. But I'm definitely getting a lot of help. Where did the idea come about from for doing this? Because it's a bit out of left field, isn't it? It is, yeah. But, you know, like I said before, I just like doing things that are sort of, you know, sort of wide ranging. But I was into crypto anyway before. Um, How come? What got you into it? I don't know. I just, I don't know how I got into crypto. I I, I made a bit of money on Verge. No, Verge was a coin. On Verge, yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, I made some, you know, I used to like investing in really small companies or, or penny stocks, basically, and watching them go. Because I was only using the money. So I used to... Like, but you're talking about crypto here, right? Yeah, So yeah. the penny stock equivalent of crypto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, not Bitcoin. I just, you know, you got you can make money on Bitcoin if you're minted, basically. But, you know, it doesn't have that hope, that potential of... 10x in or whatever you know I'm, just, I'm still a bit of a dreamer in that respect but you know it worked out a couple of times especially with verge I, I only invested about i think initially about 600 quid and i walked away with about seven grand so and i walked away just as it crashed and that was due to no skill of my own it was just pure luck you know i just pulled it out and and it just plummeted like about a week later so i was happy about that so I come out of the crypto space up, not down. Yeah, that's good. But um, whilst I was doing it, I did a lot of research into companies and stuff like that. And I, I found out that I quite like that sort of stuff, you know, like sort of finding out what the company does, trying to figure out whether it's a scam and stuff like that and doing all the research. And that's mainly the big part of it, especially with crypto. You know, there's so many scammers and rug pullers out there. It's, it's unbelievable. It is the Wild West, but I think that's what I like about it. Yeah, I suppose you could argue there's no more scammers in, and and bluffers in the crypto industry than there are in general in like the commercial or just in life. Yeah, that's right. You yeah. know, it, it's just they're visible. 
Yeah, it, they're more visible because they're all online. It's, it's all it's and the spotlights on them as well. The spotlights yeah. on them, yeah, spotlights on them. But it's quite easy to to do your your due diligence. And like with anything, um, not like with anything. I, I think uh, like the like like with the NFT bubble, if you want to, no, not a bubble implies the wrong thing, but the NFT surge of interest in it and people trying to make a quick buck and lots of people did make a quick buck off the, off the surge of interest in it, um, which that's kind of dying off now. The same is happening with cryptocurrencies where people are viewing it as a way to get rich real quick. They all see it. They all see every cryptocurrency, new or old, as the next Bitcoin is going to make a Bitcoin mil billionaire, yeah, you know, and it's not, and it's not the case. You can actually, you can absolutely use it for that, you know, for should like day trading, for example. And it's like you can, you can use it for that. I wouldn't fucking advise it, mind. It's so no. volatile. But to your point, the the the, the piece of the puzzle everyone's missing is the utility behind it. Yeah, the utility behind it is incredible. Like the crypto, the cryptocurrent, the aspect of cryptocurrency, the making money piece, that is that pales in comparison to what the opportunity there is in blockchain technology yeah. um, for for everyone, really. I mean, to, to your point about you know, using your NFTs there, like the uh, the reason I said the HR NFTs is for a, a future aspiration to be able to, it's, li it's literally to be able to, it's a control mechanism to be able to provide, to be able to identify people that the right kind of people that I want to provide access to for X, Y, or Z. Yeah. yeah because... Because you could say that, okay, if well, someone owns a HR NFT, then I can assume certain things about them. Gener like they're interested in H hour. Yep, they right? listen to the they podcast. They yeah. listen to, maybe they listen to the podcast. They have an interest in NFTs. They have an interest in blockchain technology. What you know, When I say interest, it could be a, an interest of 100% or fucking 10%. But the point is, of, of someone owning that, you can make certain assumptions about them. And then you can... I can say, okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, open up my private area of Discord to not just my patrons, but also to HR NFT owners, as an example. I'm not saying I'm gonna do that, but as an example, because because I can, and I feel like they're the right caliber of people who I want to bring in and not compromise the existing good community I've got there of, of the patrons. But yeah. I'm just the point is I'm making is there's so much opportunity there, and that's an example of the NF NFT. There thing. is, yeah, and you can do the same thing. Not using NFTs and do the same thing with just having a token like you've created. How long did it take you to create that token? You've done that from scratch because there's, there's um what in fact what network is it on? Ethereum. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the the actual token, the coin, is ready to go, but that's not going to get dropped for a little while. But when we start the voting phase, that's how we'll do it. We'll we'll, we'll put the coins out there, and the voting will be done through the you know the coin contract. So uh, the token contract, but. <laughs> I, I think we're in a really good place now because now the bubbles popped, you know, and all the money makers and scammers, they're all still out there. But now that that's all done, it, this paves the way for the good, the good things to come through. You know, I mean, a lot of these contracts are playing with a lot of these projects are playing with, you know, metaverse and stuff like that. And we could go that way if you know, if the community wants to go that way, where where do the research and where have a look and maybe putting on, I don't, you know, like classes in the metaverse. I mean, but I mean, Facebook are not doing too well with all that at the moment. But you know, it's it's a, an option. You know, Facebook's gone a weird way. <clears throat> I think they've come out, and I think they come out of it in the end. I think Facebook. No, I think Facebook will disappear. I think Facebook, Instagram maybe not. I mean, I'm just looking at it now from when I go on Facebook, right? I don't have the app. I go on my, on desktop. Yeah. And I look at it from a business perspective. So I've got like the HR page on there and the group and the group, a small group. I've got, you know, I'm, I, uh, the Force of Barbarians page on there. Just the different stuff I'm involved with. My God, the user interface. It is shocking. I mean, it is the the worst yeah. platform, the worst platform of anything I've used, including yeah. LinkedIn, to do anything as a business. It is just not. It's so comp like either complicated or not clear. And those two are similar things, but not the same. Complicated or not clear. Sometimes it takes me thirty seconds to find out to find the place. To fi and I f sound like an old man here, 
I'm like an old man tech user and I am not, right? Sometimes it takes me 20 or 30 seconds to find how I create a new post for my fucking HR page. I'm thinking, <laughs> what? This should, it should not be like this. This is crazy. Yeah. It's, cr- it's like it's. I think it's they, changed it's like, recently, though, hasn't it? No, this is. I was only on, on on the. Oh, they've changed the page layout and stuff, haven't they? But I mean, it seems to me like it's just been overloaded with overloaded with features, features yeah. overloaded, overcomplicated. So it just needs what to be simplified doing? and sort of yeah, dulled down. I, I think it'll, it'll. Yeah, I don't. What? Well, it'll. I think. Yeah, I think you're right, change. but I don't think Facebook's going anywhere. I, I think they'll start catching up and bringing in the, the younger audience again. <coughs> well, they're doing that with Instagram. Yeah. I, well, they're trying well, they've to already bought the they're short form TikTok. video, haven't they? So yeah, but they just replicate what TikTok are doing. Yeah. Like if I look at my, my kids, so I got two girls and they, they, they are 17 and 13. Hey, they don't use it. Well, uh, infrequently use Instagram. They are on Snapchat and TikTok, and they're on and Snapchat. They use as their messaging app. They yeah. hardly ever use anything else. Hardly ever use anything else. They use Snapchat for messaging, and that's from like, I, I I downloaded it like recently just because because they're that's what they use. But I'm like fuck that. I'm using that. I'm using mm-hmm. Signal and SMS. Uh, but they but my point. They use Snapchat and they use TikTok. TikTok for their social stuff, Snapchat sort of for their social stuff, but for private messaging. But my point is, they ain't using Facebook. They rarely using Instagram. Mm. They ain't using Twitter. They they are definitely not using Twitter. Twitter is alien to that generation. Yeah. Right? It's alien to them. Alien to them. It was pretty alien to me until recently. I mean, I've been on there for I've had account there for years and years and years and years. I started stepping up with it again last year and became. Not stepping up. Start using it a bit more last year and earlier this year, e- using it even more when I realised through um, Gaz Walsh over at Cineas Guild and and giving the services the, yeah. that crypto company, um, how big the crypto yeah the crypto yeah, you need you need is Twitter, on Twitter. For, yeah holy shit it's yeah, like it's a massive. whole different Twitter it's, mm. it is it's huge isn't it it's yeah, it huge is. huge and I and I like the platform and like uh, like the way it works but going back to my point the kids ain't using. Twitter or Instagram or I, fucking certainly not LinkedIn. I, I think it's like, certain demographics though. So I, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of young Nigerian people on my page, and they're really into NFTs. And are crypto. they are they princes? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Have they got a hundred million to give you? I don't know. I hope yeah. so. <laughs> they're real people. Yeah, they're okay. real people. Yeah, no, no. no. I was yeah. joking. Yeah, but they're. <laughs> yeah, I just think because I'm thinking. Because I put the adverts out there and I think, well, I'll put it out to all these people and I realise that not everyone's using Facebook anymore, you know, especially that certain, I mean, you know, certain ages are. Um, but when it comes to young people, not a lot. But then you, there are a lot in sort of like the Philippines and they're massive NFT users. And so are, you know, people in Nigeria. They love NFTs. Why do you think crypto. that is though? Why do you think it's I, I think it's about the stability of the banking system, you know, because... I, I don't. It's, it's got to be something to do with that, you know. They're still using Facebook. I don't know why they're not on Twitter or anything else, but it's just it seems to all be Philippines and Nigerians coming through on the Facebook page, and then you go on Twitter, and it's a complete different demographic, you know. And so I'm waiting now. I don't really have anyone on on the uh, Discord channel yet because I only set it. I only finished setting it up yesterday. So have you got anyone on there? I've got about eight people on there, I think. Can I be number nine? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Where's the link? <laughs> Where's the link? Go on, uh, if you go on my um, uh, grapplebeast.com, all Grapple, the links to Grapple, all the socials are on there. So. Do not know. Grapplebeast.com. You'll probably come up now that the website's down or something. <laughs> no, I love the artwork. Who's doing the artwork for the NFTs? So I, I designed them. Yeah. And then um, I've... I use my um, NFT guy for for putting the layers on and stuff like that. Yeah, they're so cool. I, I did the original drawing, and then the layers were done by somebody else. Yeah, they are cool. Right, I'm trying to get in. I mean, that's just a few of them, and there's three thousand. There's uh, Discord. Right, the Discord link isn't taking me to the server. Oh, really? No. It was working yesterday. Oh, it should be. It should be taking me. Oh, it is now. Yeah, got it. Okay, Grapple B, send it to you. Accept invite. 
I, yeah, so that um, that link was the invite, so you just go on it, yeah. I clicked it twice and it just took me to my own server. Oh, really? Yeah, it must have been a problem. Not with the website, with my uh, phone. Anyway, so I'm going in now. Cool, got a piece NFT. All right, yeah. Sweet. What were we on about then? That looks awesome, man. Oh, we're on about Nigerians and uh, <coughs> Nigerians and Philippines. Yeah, I wonder why. That's an interesting point about the, the uh, financial stability, but I don't see... Hmm. I know certainly the a lot of people in the Philippines they were sort of playing those uh, the the games on like the Ethereum blockchain where they get payouts and some of them are earning a lot of money from it uh, and yeah. able to pay their mortgages and stuff and you know pay the rent every week so you know so what's the, so you got you so what's the next step for Grapple Beast then what's the next in the, in the plan next is uh, marketing for Twitter and Discord. And I spoke to a guy yesterday, and he's got something like 1.9 million followers, so I'm going to get that guy on board. He wants to get on board and, and do some of the marketing and stuff. So. When are you planning on having your first courses available? Um, I think the dates are actually on the website. It tells you down there. I can't tell you off the top of my head. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Right. But yeah, all, everything you need to know is on the website. So it will tell you when the, the dates for the drops. So when you first mint the nft for about three i think three or four weeks you won't know which one you've got until i reveal it so, uh. so and it will be random as well and there will also be a prize there's two so basically the the belts go up in rarity i think there's about a thousand white belts there are 800 blue belts 600 brown belts uh, and basically goes right up to red where there's only two and they're really rare and there will be a special prize for whoever gets those. And you won't know until... Is yeah. there anyone else doing this kind of thing in the NFT world through through grappling MMA brands? I don't think so. UFC or NFT, aren't they? I think. I don't know. Maybe they're not. Maybe they are. I've not seen another grapple one anyway, or B Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah. I know, I mean, eventually we might make a few geese or something, you know, for... We'll see. But just a bit yeah. fluid at the moment. But the, the education thing is what we're focusing on. There's an ex mill guy up here called Paul Paul Grinnell. Uh, no, Paul, Paul Grinnell. And he um, he's BJJ, trains, uh, trains at a few. I can't remember which gym he's at now. Anyway, he's local. I'll fire it over to him. I'll fire it. He'll, he'll be interested in this. Good yeah, guy. So. Good guy. Uh, he's got a podcast as well, actually. Is it really? Yeah. It's called The Primary. Is it? Primary physio? The, pri the primary physio? No, not the primary physio. I need to check this now. <laughs> One second. I don't want to do him a disservice here. <clears throat> uh, the physio, 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 physio. Yeah, grapp grappling with physio. The grappling with physio <laughs> podcast. What a fucking moron. I forgot. I'll look that up. Yeah, he's been on, he's been on, the, he's been on the podcast. <clears throat> I'm going to send you his... Um, I'll send it to you after this. Yeah, I'll send it to him. Interesting. Uh, I like the sound of it, mate. I like the sound of it. I like the see. It's nice to hear about uh, someone doing an NFT thing, right? Doing like get into the, the NFT sphere, and uh, but because of its utility, not yeah. because oh, let's create an NFT and I'm going to be make millions off of morons. No, yeah. so let's create an NFT and use it. That, that business structure to exploit doesn't work. the technology yeah. for a good reason. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. And this is good because. For the relative, for the relatively cheap price of an NFT, whatever the prices are, and if every from fucking hundreds of thousands up down to like a dollar, um, you can get something else from it that you wouldn't have to pay for just for, just for being a part of something the to, community to elevate yourself as well. Mm. And education is as a magical way of doing that to people. So you could be anyone. You know, it don't matter where you grew up, as long as you got access to a computer and online. I mean, even the poorest places have got that now. So as long as you've got access to a computer and online, you can do anything. Yeah. Right. Uh, Grapplebeasts.com. Yep. Okay. What have we not covered that you wanted to cover today? Hmm? We covered Grapple Beasts. Happy we covered that. Glad I covered that. TV and film. Glad we covered that. Uh, yeah. Anything else? Not off the top of my head. Um, oh. So grapplebeast.com, uh, for anyone who's 
who's uh, not heard of Discord either. Use Discord. So there's a HR Discord community. There's a Grapple Beast Discord community. I know a lot of people who listen or watch this are Sin Eaters Guild fans. There's a Sin Eaters Guild Discord community. Uh, Discord free app, community building, conversation, network. It's yeah. fucking brilliant. I didn't discover it until... Uh, in fact, again, guys, while you mentioned it, getting into that, that he's in the that tech side, really interesting. So go on to grapplebeasts.com. If you go on your phone now, folks, you will see in the top right of the screen the Twitter link, the Facebook link, the Insta- oh, the, the, the logos, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and there's another little one, which, what is that? It's like a, it's like, it's like a gamepad, isn't it? The Discord logo is like a little gamepad, yeah, isn't it? With like two I'm eyes. I'm not sure. Oh, it looks like something <laughs> from Super Mario or something. <laughs> but yeah, next to next to the social icons, there's another little one you may not recognise. Hit that as Discord, and it'll, it'll say uh, accept invite to uh, Grapple Beasts NFT Discord server and accept the invite, and then go and find the HR one. Yeah, sweet, sweet, then, mate. Enjoyed it. Yeah, I did. Thank you. Yeah, it was good. Let's go and get a scoff. Sweet, I'm starving. <laughs> That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear. If not, if it's not already appeared, uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of H-Hour. Becoming a patron of H-Hour, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews, which I do with each guest, that last about 5-10 minutes, that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H-Hour have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast starts getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about 10 minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they only release to patrons. They never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to... A Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away give away gifts to my patron supporters, and it's all like well, predominantly veteran owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran owned apparel, veteran owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events, so you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of H Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash. HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.